Well, I just want to welcome everybody here to Embrace at all of our campuses. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here, and as always, we're so excited and humbled and truly honored that you've decided to worship here with us today. Now, uh, just being totally honest with all of you, from time to time as a husband, I tend to drive my wife a little crazy. Uh, more accurate would be completely, completely crazy. You see, I randomly get these ideas, and they only stay ideas for a few moments before I try to make them a reality as fast as I possibly can. And my wife knows this about me. I'm not a person who just randomly dreams and then forgets about things. I get these random ideas and then I want to implement them as fast as possible. But each time though, in order to move forward, I first have to approach my wife and ask her for permission because I want to stay a married man. I love my marriage. I love my wife. And so I need to get her permission before I get started. And so I approach her and when I do, I must get a certain look on my face because before I even speak, it's like she's God. Psalm 139, before a word is on my tongue, she, my wife, knows it completely, right? And so I approach her and before I even say something, she'll say something like this, do I even want to know? Do I even want to know? I'm like, I haven't said anything yet. Do I even want to know? I haven't even brought anything up. What are you talking about? Do I even want to know? She'll say that or she'll just say, now what? Now what? I'm like, I didn't even say anything. This is going bad fast. Anyways, well, in the past, there's a reason my wife feels this way. Because in the past, one of my random ideas, and I've shared this before, one of my random ideas was chickens. We needed chickens, and well, we ended up with four chickens. And honestly, our family is the most complete it's ever been because of these backyard chickens. So that was one idea. Another random idea I got was an old car. I love old cars. And so this idea would lead to one of the greatest purchases of all time, my 1960 Rambler American, all $1,800 a few years ago. Greatest thing ever. It's brought so much joy into my life. So that was another random idea. A few years back, it was actually more like six months ago, but I'm kind of embarrassed about this one, so we're going to talk about it in the past. Like a few years ago, my random idea was I wanted a sheep. I just wanted one sheep. I looked into breeds. I kid you not. You guys are judging me right now. It's okay. I looked into breeds of, of, of getting a sheep of some kind, but fortunately for my wife, I guess the city has something to say about sheep in the backyard in the middle of town. And so for now, that's just a, an idea. After I've thought about it, actually, it's kind of a bad idea. And so uh, it's probably... <laughs> Good that one went away. But anyways, last summer though, one of my new random ideas was to get some vines. You know, just some grapevines. Why? Because I'm not really sure. Earlier that day though, I stopped by one of my neighbors. I had never met him before. He had a garage sale. I'm at my neighbor's house looking at his stuff he's trying to sell. And I couldn't help but notice all the vines that were all over the place on all the grapes that were all over the place because of it. And for me, it was one of those God moments, you know, God stirs your heart and he's just like, I think you're supposed to have vines. And so I went home, I'm totally twisting that. That didn't happen, but I went home and I think I told my wife something like, you know, Jesus talked about vines in the Bible. And uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so uh, we're going to get some, some vines. Well, needless to say, we now have two great vines planted in our backyard. They are growing fast. I have no idea what I'm going to do with these vines or these grapes. But yes, I do have the greatest wife of all time. And so on that deep, unspiritual note, there was nothing spiritually to benefit from what I just said. On that note, I'm going to have us open up our Bibles to the book of John chapter 15. John chapter 15, if you have a Bible, open it up. If you have the Bible on your phone, I would encourage you to open it up there. Take your cell phone out. If you do not have the Bible on your phone, download the YouVersion Bible app as we speak and get it on your phone. Also, if you do not have a Bible, period, at all of our campuses, we actually just got brand new Bibles. They're awesome. New Believers Bibles, they're fantastic. Stop by and grab one of those. They're free of charge. You don't have to give us anything. We'd love to have you do this. But again, John chapter 15, in this chapter, this is some of Jesus' very last words before he dies on a cross. And what does he say? Verse 5. This is a refresher from last week. He says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me... You can do nothing. Jesus is saying that when we stay connected to him, that when we stay close and connected to Jesus, that fruit, that the things of God will begin to grow and they'll begin to show up in our, in our lives. So when we stay close to Jesus, God's fruit will show up. God's peace, God's love, his kindness, his self-control will begin to grow and our lives will begin to change. When we stay close and connected to Jesus, 
God will begin, will begin to show up in our lives to the point that we'll begin to reflect God to others to the point that people will start asking us questions. They'll just say, there's something different about you. There's just something different. I mean, honestly, you used to be a jerk. You were just kind of rude and uptight, but you just have God's kindness. Like, there's, you're just kind. Like, there's something different a, a, a about you. I don't even know what it is. And you just seem to have peace and joy in your life. Like, I've been through that same trial that you're walking through right now, and yet you just seem to have God's, God's peace and joy. And you just love people. Like, you just love people. Not just like a cute post on Facebook, but you truly love people. Like, the person in the office that everyone tries to avoid, you don't just talk to them. You actually love them. Like the person who disagrees with you and is kind of rude when they do that, like you truly love them. And so it's kind of weird to ask, but can I just ask, and can you tell me about the Jesus that you follow? Because I'm just curious to know what you know. Again, when we stay close and connected to Jesus, like a branch to a vine, we'll begin to grow and our lives will become more and more like his. And now continuing on for today, here's a little bit more about what Jesus tells us. And this is starting in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. Again, verse 2 once more, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so that they will produce even more more. Okay, so what in the world is all of that about? Like I know for myself, I do not want God taking a pair of scissors to me and cutting anything off if you know what I'm saying. And can I say that in church? I just did. Anyways, so here's Jesus and he's saying that God, who is the gardener, he's saying that the gardener, he cuts off and he sets aside the branches that are not bearing fruit. Basically, the people who are maybe Christians but they're just kind of going through the motions. They're maybe followers of Jesus, but their lives aren't changing. They're not becoming more like God, and they're not really being used by God to do much of anything. With those branches, God, he cuts them off, and he sets them aside. But on the flip side, with the branches who are producing fruit, Jesus says that God prunes them, and he trims them. Why? So that they will produce even more fruit. Basically, with those who are connected to Jesus and their lives are being changed and the things of God are growing in their lives and they are reflecting God and they are being used by God, he says that with these people, he prunes them and he trims them and their lives, why? So that they will grow even more. Those who are producing fruit, God trims them, why? So that they will be changed even more so that they will become even more like Jesus. They'll be pruned, why? So they can reflect God even more, so they can be used by him even more. Now, I know for myself, I hear all this, and I'm like, okay, so I know I don't want to be a branch that's cut off and set aside. That just doesn't sound very good, and so I don't want to do that, but you mean, you mean, Jesus, if, if I'm growing and I'm becoming more like you, Jesus, that you're still going to prune and trim my, my life? Like, that just doesn't sound very good Either. And I thought that if I was doing good, that you'd leave me alone. And I thought that faithfully following Jesus meant that life would be easy and safe and comfortable, and it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any pruning involved, like the opposite of pruning. I mean, this just doesn't sound very good. I don't want to be cut off and set aside, but I also don't want to be pruned. And so this week, after reading these verses, I know for myself, I just wanted to know more about vines. And so I called up a local winery to find out more. And ended up talking with an older guy named Jim. Jim was just a great fella. As soon as I got on the phone with him, he was one of those guys that you just wanted to hang out with, you know. I'm like, Jim, you are awesome. And so I just want to be friends with you. And Jim knew everything about vines. I guess he had been working with vines for 18, 20 some, some years. Kind of random. I found out that Jim's wife's name is, is Nancy. And my parents' names are Jim and Nancy. All of a sudden I was like, Dad, am I talking to you, Dad? And maybe it was from God that I got vines planted in my backyard. I never knew dad had a winery. And so anyways, I'm talking with Jim, and I start asking him about pruning the vines. And he said, yep, we prune the vines every single fall. And the branches that are dead, we cut them off, and we set them aside. I'm like, I I've heard that before, you know. I've read that about that. And so he said with all the branches, though, that do produce fruit, he says we, we, we trim them. And we cut them back, and we, we prune them. Why? Because if we don't next year, all these branches will grow is just leaves. If we don't prune them, if we don't trim them back, they'll just produce a whole bunch of leaves or they'll produce small fruit. And he said, I mean, if you want the vine and the branches to do well, 
you have to trim them back. I mean, basically, it's not a bad thing that you trim branches, that you prune branches. It's a very good thing, and the branches will grow even more fruit. As soon as he said that, I was like, man, that is powerful. Like Jesus actually knew what he was talking about when he said vine and branches and, and pruning. And so I thanked Jim, and I ended the call by saying, I love you, Dad. No, I didn't. But anyways, seriously, though, going back to God and him pruning us, and that was awesome. Him pruning us, all this is good, right? All this talk of pruning is good, but maybe you're here and you're just wondering, well, how does this work? Like, what does it mean to be pruned by God? Like, I'm kind of nervous about him pruning my life, and so what does it look like to be pruned by God? And there's so many things that we could talk about today, but for today, I just want to talk about three specific things and three specific ways that God prunes us. And so how does God prune us? First off, he prunes us through conviction. He prunes us through conviction conviction. And today, honestly, out of everything I say, maybe this is the one thing that you needed to hear. Again, how are we pruned? You see, the closer and closer we get to God, the more God will begin to convict and highlight things in our lives that need to change. The closer and closer we get to him, the more we remain and stay connected to Jesus, the more God will begin to convict and highlight places in our lives that need some attention. The closer we get to him, the more and more he will begin to point out different things in our lives that honestly need to change or go away. Again, God prunes us how? Through conviction. I know for myself, I can remember as a, as a new Christian in college, when God began to prune my own life, and he began to honestly address some things in my private life, even more specifically, he be, began to address some things in my dating relationships. Out of nowhere, I mean, truly out of nowhere, I'd been doing it for a while, it's like, out of nowhere, God just began to highlight some things like, are you really okay with this? Like that, I was like, well, actually, yeah, okay. It's, it's, it's good, like I'm, I'm good, it doesn't bother me, it's not, I'm, I'm okay, okay with it. Are you not okay? Are you really okay with this, Weber? Like you, you know that's not pleasing to me and you're really cool with it being in, in your life? Again, things that never used to bother me, things that I would have never given a second thought about, God just began to highlight, it's just like, you're really okay with that? He just began to highlight in, within me and it was, very intentional. It wasn't like accidentally something was happening. Instead, God, the gardener, was very intentionally began to prune and trim some things in my, my life through conviction. He's just like, are you really cool with this? Well, fast forward to today, and even after following Jesus for 18 years now, I know that God is still pruning and trimming my life. Now, honestly, in the, the one area that just continued to come to the surface within me this past week is in the area of patience. Um, personality profiles, like I'm like I'm fairly high, like I'm in the top percentiles of, of, of being an impatient person, basically. Pray for my wife, if you would. And, and having urgency is a good thing, and I'm huge on making things happen. I'm a person who's like, gosh, can we somehow make that happen? That's, that, that's awesome, but pure impatience and often the frustration that follows when something doesn't happen on my timeline clearly is not from God. And God's just highlighting it right now, just... Anytime impatience comes up, he's just like, do you see this thing right here? I'm like, I don't see anything. And then he just like takes out this giant spotlight. And he's like, okay, you need some help. You're really kind of slow. Okay, we're going to help you. I'm just going to put a giant spotlight right on that. It's like, oh, you're talking about, about that? That really, you don't, you don't like that? Like I thought that was okay. And for all of us in these moments, whether it's with something big or it's with something small, we can either be faithful to God and hear what he has to say, and we can allow him to prune our lives, or in those moments we can close our ears, and we can distance ourselves from him. But once again, the closer and closer we get to Jesus, the more he will begin to highlight and convict us, and he will prune us through conviction. A good thing to note with this, and really to highlight about pruning through conviction, hear this, at times, pruning can be downright painful. At times, pruning is painful. I mean, at times God will highlight something in our life that we do not want to change. 
He will highlight something in our lives that we are totally okay with. We actually claim it as part of our identity. Like, I'm just, this is my way. Like, this is just how I am. This is just my attitude. Like, God will begin to highlight some things in our lives from a, a bad relationship to something we're doing that we thoroughly enjoy that we just know is not okay. Again, God will begin to convict and highlight things as the closer we get to him. And why will we do this? Why will God do this to us? So that we can grow even more. So we can grow even more. The other day on the phone call with Jim, one of the things he told me that I won't forget, I just thought was powerful, he said when pruning, afterwards, sometimes it will look like you've almost killed the vine. A, a vine will need so much pruning that when you're, when you're done with it, it will almost look like you've killed it. Like you've killed the, the plant, you've killed the vine, you've, you, you've just killed the branches and it, you do it. For, for the good of the vine, you do it for the branches themselves. It's not an accident. Instead, it's very, very intentional. I just thought that was powerful. Once more, at times, pruning is painful. It's the opposite of easy. So that's the first thing to mention. God prunes us through conviction. And then secondly, how does God prune us? He prunes us in and through circumstances. And let's just say that our God, the great gardener, will use anything to prune us. Circumstances, both good things and bad. And maybe for you, this is how God is pruning you right now. You came and, and just this last week or this last month or maybe this last year, you just feel like God is, is, is pruning you. And I know for myself, two of the biggest things that have pruned me also just happen to be two of the greatest blessings in my life, marriage and parenting. And all of our campuses, can we get an amen in the house of God? Okay, we have some liars here today. <laughs> I would have never, ever considered myself to be a selfish person until the, the day I got married and four kids showed up. And four kids didn't come all at once, thank God, but they, they, you know what I'm saying. And so God can use good things, wonderful things that come from him. But hear this, he can also use things in our life, and he can use circumstances that he doesn't like. He can use circumstances, he can use things in our life that he didn't cause our God, he can use circumstances. He can use things in and through our lives that he flat out hates. Things like cancer. He didn't cause it. He can use it. Things like divorce. Jesus is clear. God is not a fan. Jesus actually says God hates divorce, and yet he can use that too. Health stuff, addiction, to put it nicely, all out crappy situations. That's putting it nicely, isn't it? He can use it all to prune us, to grow us, to shape us, to make our heart look more and more like his. Looking at my own life, and my own life, God didn't cause it. He didn't like it. Some of the stuff I went through as a kid in school, he was able to use it. Beck and I being broke through grad school and worrying about bills constantly. For six months, we were on WIC. We couldn't buy groceries. He used it. Even my dad's bad health these past seven years. I can't even explain how hard it's been. I mean, just grueling, but he's using it as well. Through circumstances, both good and bad, we come to see what true joy and peace and patience looks like, right? Through circumstances, God can use circumstances to develop our character. I always love the quote, God is more concerned about our character than he is our comfort. Our God, both good and bad, he can use circumstances to show us what really matters. Today, I'm not sure what you're walking through. I'm not sure what circumstance you're, you're just trying to, you know, just one foot in front of the next through. Maybe it's a circumstance that you went through 10 years ago that's still like just, man, I'm still grieving. It was maybe last month. I'm not sure what it is. All I know is every week, the prayer requests that come in, at times I'm just overwhelmed. By, this, by the circumstances we're going through. Once again, though, our God, the great gardener, he can use circumstances, and just let me tell you, he can use this circumstance for good. He can use it to grow us even more. And so God can prune us through conviction and circumstances, and then lastly, God can prune our lives through steps of faith. Basically, God can prune us in the places and times where he challenges us to take a step out. And today, maybe that's you. Maybe you look at conviction, there's not really anything coming to the surface. Maybe circumstances, your life has never been better, but there's just this one specific thing 
that you just know that God is just asking you to take. And maybe it's like, but God, I don't want to step out. Instead, I want to stay right where I am. But God, what, what if I fail? Like, what, what, what if I risk something and I fail? And Lord, just being honest, I, I don't want to make this change. And I don't want to step away from what's comfortable. And I honestly don't want to step away from my plan for years. Like, I'm, I'm a really planned person, and I've thought through this plan really, really well. Trust me. I got advisors. I know exactly what I'm doing. I don't want to give up my plan for years. And I don't want to do what you told me to do. And I don't want to put myself out there. And yet, in these moments, how does God respond to us? He reaches out his hand, and he says, do you trust me? Do you trust me? But God, what if I screw up? Do you trust me? But God, I'm, it's too late. I'm too old to make this change. Do you trust me? But God, my marriage is over. Do you trust me? But God, I'm scared. Do you trust me? God, what will other people think if I do that? Do you, do you trust me? My own life for me that was saying yes to following Jesus for the first time when I wondered if God wanted anything to do with me. For me, that was in college leading a small group when I was clueless about the Bible. I had never read through it. I'm like, who am I to tell someone else about, uh, about, about Jesus? For me, that was trading in God's five-year plan, my five-year plan for his. It was just giving up mine for his. It's like, I do not want to become a pastor. Are you kidding me? For me, that was tithing when it made no sense. I thought it was my money. For me, that's been talking with someone or loving someone who's, who's different from me or is hard to love. For me, that's been inviting people to church. It's like I could invite every stranger on the planet, no question, no problem, but it comes to my friends and my family, and it's like, I just don't know if I want to invite them. Like, it's like, can I just go to Africa and invite people? Because I'm just not really sure that I want to invite my family member because that's just awkward, right? I've, I've shared it before, but stepping out for me has been standing up here each week. And, and sharing with all of you. I mean, even last week, I had a few weeks off. I come up here and I'm crazy nervous. Scared out of my mind is, is more like it. I struggled to sleep the night before. But again, in these moments, Jesus just reaches out his hand. He says, Adam, do you trust me? Jenny, do you trust me? Tim, do you trust me? Well, if you do, then take my hand and take the step out. But what if I fail? What if I try to change and I can't? What if I talk to that person and they think I'm nuts? Again, do you trust me? Once more, our God, the great gardener, he can prune us through conviction, through circumstances and steps of faith. Conviction, circumstances, and, and steps of faith. And why does he do so? We've already said it. So that we can grow even more. Just like Jim told me with his vines, it's not a bad thing. Instead, it's a good thing. You have to prune the branches if you want them to grow. And so God wants us to grow, right? And he wants us to become more like him and he wants us to reflect his grace and his truth to other people. But listen in, there's actually an even deeper reason for why Jesus says to this to us. If you ever read, read through the Bible and you're just like, I just wish Jesus would tell me why he says this. Like, I've read this story and I just wonder, like, I just kind of wish God would just say like, oh, and by the way, here's why I'm telling you this. John 15, we're told. It's pretty awesome. Verse 11, again, God wants us to grow, but even more, listen to this. Jesus says, I've told you these things. Why? So that you will be filled with my joy. I have told you these things, yes, so your joy will overflow. Why joy? Awesome, right? Why does God want us to grow so that our lives and all that we are would be filled and it would overflow with his joy? I mean, basically, why does the gardener prune us? Sometimes it's painful, right? It's like, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Whether he caused it or not, whether he's a fan of it or he's, he hates it, why are you doing this, God? Why does he do it? Because he loves us. He's able to use even the crappiest of circumstances. Even our biggest mistakes, it was our mistakes, not God. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't him that got us here. It was our foolishness. Why does he do it? Why does he prune us? He, because he loves us. As our father, I know for myself, as a dad, as a parent, all I want for my kids is for them to know Jesus and for their lives to be filled with joy. That's it. What do you, what do you want from me, dad? Nothing. I want you to follow Jesus I want your life to be filled with joy. That's it. That's success, son, daughter. If you want to be successful in dad's eyes, you just follow Jesus, brokenness and all. And I just want you to have joy in your life. As our father, the gardener, he, 
wants our lives to be filled and overflow with his, his joy. And he knows that when we love him and we grow and we become more like him and we reflect him to others that this happens. And the Psalms, one of my favorite verses, David just says that in God's presence, just being close to him, there's fullness of joy. Just being near him, like just being close to him, there's, there's fullness of joy. I just wonder, anybody looking for joy? Anybody looking for, for, for joy? And when I hear this, I don't know about you, but today from the depth of who I am, it's just like, God, today, I want that. I just, I just want to be with you. I just want to be connected to, to you. Like I heard one time that like a, a branch is connected to a vine. Like that's just how I want to be. I want to remain. I want to abide. I want to be continually present with. I want to become one with, with you. I just want to be near you so that I can grow even more so I can have more joy in my life and just overflow. And so on behalf of all of us at all of our campuses today, God, we, we come before you. And today, whether it's through conviction or circumstances or it's a step of faith, God, would you please, please prune us? Would you just prune us, Lord? It's kind of scary. Sometimes it's just painful. But God, would you prune us so we can grow even more so that our lives would overflow with your joy? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, heavenly King, we, we come before you, the great gardener. We surrender our lives to you. If we're not connected to you today, Jesus, we, we want a relationship with you. We want to follow you. We don't want to follow ourselves. Lord, the older I get, the more foolish I become. We just, we just, we just want to be connected to you. We just want to stay close to you. And God, even more than that, we, we ask that today you'd prune us. We'd pr you'd just prune us through conviction, through circumstances, God, would you, through steps of faith, would you just prune us so we can grow even more, so that your joy would just overflow our lives. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, amen.